Cool. All right. So, yeah, um, this is Sarah Stewart here at UC Davis. Uh, what's your title here, and how long have you been here? I'm a professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. I've been here almost five years. Well, first one is just how would you describe a synestia? What is a synestia? And maybe from that, what is the origin of the idea for a synestia? It took us a long time to figure out what a synestia was. We stumbled upon it by looking at what happened to planets when they got really hot, because they get really big. And normally we think of planets as having a spheroidal shape and rotating all together. And we were finding these bodies that didn't look like that. Hmm. And what we learned is that you can actually make a planet too hot so that it breaks all the rules of being a planet and it becomes a new astronomical object. And we named it a synestia. Gotcha. So, and th the shape of a synestia, I've heard it described as a big, like, jelly donut kind of, <laughs> is that, you know, kind of, kind of accurate? I mean, when you see the shape, it gives you a sense of it, but... So, a synestia is basically a rotating ball of gas, but it's not a sphere like the Earth. It has a technical term, it's mm -hmm. called a biconcave disc, mm. which is what a red blood cell looks like. Oh, perfect. In our simulations after a giant impact, the shape looks like a puffy donut with an iron core in the middle, and so the press called it the space donut. The space donut, beautiful. <laughs> Leave it to the press, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, the name of synesthesia is really interesting. A lot of people keep getting it confused with synesthesia. Um, what, where did the name come from? Like. So planets are named after Greek gods and goddesses, and so we decided to stick with that tradition. And so synestias are named after Hestia, the Greek goddess of the hearth and home. Mm. And we picked it just because it was something warm and the, the earth, so home. Mm. And we used sin as the prefix because the object is all connected from the core all the way out to the farthest gas. And we wanted to emphasize that connection, so we called it synestia. Gotcha. Go into the like process of, of finding this. So most discoveries nowadays in, in formation seem to be simulation driven. Can you go into that a little bit? Like, wh what are we simulating here? And what variables go into it? So we, the discovery of synestias was a really convoluted process. <laughs> like, there was no straight path. We didn't know what we were going to end up with. All we knew was we were trying to understand how to make the moon. So if the moon forms from a giant impact, the giant impact traditionally makes a planet surrounded by a disk. And what we do is take computer simulations of the giant impact and then try and break it apart into two pieces, a disk around a planet. And what we found was that we couldn't do that in a way that was robust after very high energy giant impacts. And it looked like the planet and the disk were connected in a way that hadn't been found in earlier studies. And so the rules that we were applying to break it into pieces weren't working. And then we were stuck because we didn't know what the right answer was. And we got unstuck by asking a basic question again, which was, what is a planet and how do we define a planet? And when do we have a planet and a disk and mm. when we have something else. And so by going back in and saying, when can a body rotate all together and when does it break that rule and become hot and large enough that the outer parts actually rotate like a disk, that's when we finally figured out what a synestia gotcha. is. Gotcha. And that kind of goes into the co-rotational limit a little bit, right? So outside the co-rotational yeah. limit is that disk-like. Is that right? And then so inside is... When you think of it that way, as a planet's a body that can rotate all together, mm. when you reach the limit of that, we call that the co-rotation limit for a planet. And if you exceed that limit, you become this new object, okay. the synestia. Okay. Yeah. Is, it, is it inside the co-rotational limit? Is it basically just viscous forces and like, like fluid forces, really, that it's keeping it together? Uh, and outside that is orbit. It's an orbit, essentially. Or when you... Uh, when a planet can rotate all together, mm. the structure of the planet, sort of the pressure with distance or the density with distance, mm. is determined by gravity and mm. hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Okay. When a body exceeds that limit, there's now a large rotational term, and there's no way that the body can rotate all together and have 
a pressure profile that's physical. Okay. So what happens is the outer part has to rotate more slowly in order to maintain a normal pressure gradient. Okay. Okay. What what are where are the error bars? Like where where are there big areas that still need to be looked into? I, before we started recording, you said that there was still a lot of uncertainty, but so. The discovery of synestias and the fact that a synestia is a new type of astronomical object is absolutely robust. Mm. I have no question that this is a real thing in nature. Uh, Where the uncertainty lies is how do you make a moon inside a synestia? And we're just at the tip of the iceberg in trying to understand that. So we published an initial study to try and understand how a synestia cools. And it cools by radiation leading to the formation of magma rain that falls inward and those rain droplets can collect into a moon that orbits inside the synestia Mm. and grows. And because it's orbiting inside the synestia, it should have the chemical characteristics of the thing that is growing inside. And so that is our explanation for why the moon has such a chemical bond with the Earth. And in particular, there's a specific measurement that uh, confuses everyone, which are the isotopes. Every element has different weight nuclei, and those are called the isotopes of the different elements. And the Earth and the Moon are almost isotopic twins. Mm. And previous models for moon formation actually predicted that they wouldn't be twins. Hmm. And so we propose that the reason why the Moon's isotopes are the same as Earth is because the Moon formed inside the Earth when the Earth was a synestia. Yeah, so I guess the next thing about accretion modeling, that's that's still really where the big problem is. So the next step is to link a physical model of growing the moon in the synestia and cooling the synestia. And it's a coupled problem, but the fluid dynamics of it is hard. (laughs) And there's no off-the-shelf code that can solve that problem today, and so it requires development. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it, it, you said a minute ago that uh, it was it was it's clear that it is a new astrophysical object. Is it? Are synestias generally accepted now as a as you know almost not superseding the giant impact hypothesis, but like a, a really like a leading hypothesis? So synestia or, idea for yeah. the origin of the moon is is new. Mm-hmm. It's got people's attention. Mm. There are com- Competing ideas in that people are trying to change the previous models in order to make them explain the observations, and mm-hmm. that's still a work in progress. Okay. I'm quite optimistic that it will lead to something interesting, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but the details of exactly what, which synestias could make a moon that's like our moon is not solved. Okay, gotcha. Oh yeah, this is just a small technical thing. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out, trying to like sort of nail down, what was the spin rate after impact? Um, like do we, what are the range of hour long days? Like right. I've heard from two to five. Yes. It's, it's uncertain. Two to five. <laughs> Somewhere so, between there. So currently the moon is moving away from the earth because of tides. Right. And as the moon moves away, the earth's rotation slows down to conserve angular momentum. And if you go back in time to where the moon formed, mm. the Earth would have a five-hour day. Five hours, okay. okay. But s- other things could have happened mm. to change the length of Earth's day. And if they did, then Earth could have been spinning faster. And it's actually easier to put more mass farther out in the disk if the Earth were spinning faster, which would help explain our large moon. Mm. And so a high angular momentum giant impact can help make a very extended disk and a very hot disk and perhaps solve another problem related to the orbit of the moon, which is the inclination of the moon. Okay, gotcha. That's (laughs) perfect lead-in because the next question, I mean, I'm definitely going to go to Matia about this, but um, uh, the inclination of the moon is a weird thing because it's only five degrees off the ecliptic, but uh, can you... Maybe can you give just a little overview about Laplace uh, plane transition, and then I think we'll be kind of out of time. <laughs> I'll explain the the, the, the general idea. problem, okay. right? So, if the moon formed in a disk around Earth's equator, we would expect that the moon's orbit would have no inclination, and even though uh, the moon has moved outward in time, there are other f- dynamical processes that would keep it in Earth's equator. Mm. 
what we see is the moon's orbit is inclined by about five degrees, and it turns out that's really hard to explain. <laughs> and so if a giant impact tilted Earth over so that it had a high obliquity compared to the ecliptic of the solar system, the moon would have formed in that tilted equator. Later, as the moon moves outward, the reference frame transitions from being the Earth's equator to being the plane of the sun, and that's called the Laplace plane transition. And when that happens, there's an interaction between the three bodies that changes the tilt of the Earth, so it's less, has a less, a smaller angle mm. compared to the plane of the solar system, and that leaves the moon in a high inclination orbit. So we published a model that says that the reason why the moon's orbit is inclined is because it actually used to be more inclined in the past, and it's just not gone all the way to zero. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a complicated problem. <laughs> it is a very strange yeah. dynamical situation <sighs> in that it's odd and requires a special explanation. Mm. It's not something you would expect to happen naturally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And we haven't seen that, that inclination issue anywhere else in the solar system, have we? Or? Uh, I don't know that there's evidence of a Laplace plane transition. You'd have okay. to see, you have to talk to Matya about that. Okay. <laughs> see other <laughs> dynamical things, and we see that the tilts of planets have changed. Mm. And that can lead to mm. tilting the orbit of moons. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. I'll definitely ask him about mm. that. I mean, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is how much of the, uh, like, the Gadget 2 uh, simulation for the Synestia. Um, this was like a 2D cross section type of simulate. Like, was this a full 3D SPH? Yeah, SPH is usually calculated in full 3D. Okay. And especially when we're. Yeah, a giant impact is a 3D event, mm. right? There's no plane of symmetry that lets you flip and mirror what's going uh, on. Right. Only if there were a head on impact could you do that. Right. And none of them are head on impacts. Okay. And so they are full 3D models. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, how long did the the sim, Sims take? I mean, like just physically, hardware wise. So on uh, 2012 computers, they would take about a month okay. high resolution, and now we can do ten times more particles, and it still takes about a month. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's pretty much the limit for how long you want to wait. Are we up to a hundred million particles? Uh, a billion? No, no hundred million that's people don't do. Okay. Uh, million? So <laughs> million is is possible. Okay. Uh, you have to be patient. Most people okay. don't run all their simulations at a million. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Um, yeah, any burning thoughts about Sinestia? If, if you were going to talk to somebody specifically. Right. So astronomers are looking for Sinestias around other stars. Mm. They would be big enough and bright enough to detect, just like we can detect exoplanets. Mm. You just have to find a young star that had a giant impact not very long ago because Sinestias don't live very long, mm. only hundreds of years. But because we have observatories looking for planets around nearby stars, like the TESS mission, they are in place to find a Synestia uh, by accident. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> I'm excited for that. Wow, Cross awesome. your fingers. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. You're and welcome. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely be sending you this when it's all done, <laughs> okay. all of the various mediums. <laughs> all right.